We're seeing quite an escalation in the Middle East, from the war in Israel to the Houthi attacks and US retaliatory airstrikes. Iran is feeding missiles to multiple factions in the Middle East. The US has already lost troops to attacks of Iranian proxy groups. The US has struck back and it's entirely possible more US personnel might lose lives as the situation keeps escalating. Some limited strikes on Iranian assets might eventually happen. And then all hell might break loose. This video will look into why the US might consider striking Iran. We'll look into the basic and logistics problems the US might encounter if it does decide to attack it. Finally, we'll explore what sort of forces might the US use and what defenses Iran has. Stay tuned to see the air campaign in detail. US strikes on Iranian proxy groups are escalating. It's not easy to track the news as not all media sources cover events in the same way. That's why today's sponsor, Ground News, helps get better insight into the situation. Ground News is an app and a website that gathers articles related to various events from across the world to give you an in-depth analysis on any topic. I went through this piece of news, Iran warning about spy ships in the Mideast. There are over 45 articles covering it and right-leaning sources are covering it a bit more. You can check that out here. And here you see where the articles are coming from. There are even Russian sources listed. A great tool that I love is the Ground News interactive map that's available on their app. I can move anywhere around the globe to zoom in on a region and learn more about events happening there. Ground News makes it easier to track the ever-changing geopolitical landscape. Check it out yourself by going to ground.news. Their plans start at $1 per month, but if you click my link down below, you'll get 30% off their unlimited access vantage plan. That's the same one I use. So, give it a try. As said, the situation in the Middle East is escalating. Iran is obviously giving Houthis weapons, but also likely aiding with intelligence data needed to target ships. It's also supplying militia groups in Syria and Iraq with weapons. So, these are some wild times. It's not unimaginable that all that escalates into something bigger. For example, the US might target seemingly neutral ships that bring in missile parts into Houthi lands. Or the US might target Iranian surveillance drones. Iran and Hezbollah up north might escalate to a real war. Iran might decide to help Hezbollah or even the Houthis. Chances of US striking Iranian forces might rise. It's becoming more plausible that Iranian, US or Israeli lives will be lost in some incident. In the past, such threshold events did sometimes transform limited military ops into broader wars. So that would be why a US air campaign against Iran might happen. There's also a whole other discussion on why a big air campaign against Iran might not be in US interests. But that's a topic outside the scope of this particular video. If the US were to do a large air campaign against Iran, it would be met with several problems. There would be the issue of the goal of such a large air campaign. In a sense, since we're already looking at only one war option, a whole air campaign, we're assuming the goal is something substantial. Sporadic missile strikes or airstrikes on border targets might happen before that, but this video goes beyond those. What's basically impossible for airstrikes to achieve is a change of leadership policies in Iran. So a big air campaign could realistically try to seriously degrade Iran's economic, industrial and military capabilities. Oil economy, power plants, various factories, not limited only to weapons production. Immediate military targets might be known locations of current Iranian leadership and generals. Iran has over 110 large and medium-sized power plants, which are sprawling facilities with multiple generators and, judging from Iranian-owned claims, there would be over 500 separate targets just there. There might be a few thousand targets when it comes to the entire power network, involving many substations. Going after individual oil and gas wells would be hard, as there are literally tens of thousands of such wells. But oil and gas storage sites and a dozen or so refineries represent a much easier target set. Still, with sprawling facilities, those two would likely require hundreds of precise strikes. There might be hundreds to tens of thousands of various other industry and economic targets, depending on how much damage the US would want to do. But even if the US would focus only on Iran's military and nuclear capabilities, the said target set would not be small. There are some dozen sprawling facilities tied to Iran's nuclear program, not counting those that may not be publicly known. 
Some of those feature underground complexes that can't be reached with cruise missiles and require heavier bunker-busting weapons. There are likely dozens of targets inside each of those facilities, possibly requiring hundreds of weapons. While going for the entire military would be out of the question, a more sensible goal for the US might be going for big-ticket items, such as ships and planes, but also command, communications and storage facilities and direct threats such as offensive missile launchers and their facilities, and the air defense network as that would be standing in the way of most other strikes. Those two categories combined could easily lead to 2,000 individual targets, adding in harbors, ports, airports and air bases, essentially most of Iran's air force, the US might decide to go after over 3,000 individual military targets. But such a detailed campaign would also require many assets. And there comes another problem, bases available to the US. Iran is a fairly big country. Even if the US largely ends up ignoring the northeastern part of Iran, that's still 500 miles just to reach the middle of Iran, from the closest possible bases available to the US. The US would be using fewer bases than it had access to in 2003 against Iraq. And even though it would need more in-air refueling assets to help reach targets deep inside Iran, it would have fewer room for those air tankers. Basically, that would lead to a protracted campaign. The complicating factor is that the bases closest to Iran are also most likely to suffer Iranian attacks. So it's not assured most of US air power would come from those. Here is a show of US bases in the Middle East, coupled with some possible additional bases. The bases in Oman are, for example, not very well developed, and the US has been using those mostly for storage. The airbase in Qatar is one of the US largest, but not only is it close to Iran, it's also politically shaky, as Qatar has at times been quite cordial with Iranian leadership, and it can't be assumed the US would get a green light for strikes into Iran from said base. Saudi Arabia would be a much better staging ground, and the US has been negotiating to expand its presence there, so the two bases in the west of the country might very well be used by the US and various completely new build bases in Saudi Arabia would be all but unavoidable. Without the Saudis, there would hardly be an effective air campaign against Iran. Saudi Arabia and Iran are adversaries and have been threatening each other with military action many times. It has yet to be seen how polite to each other the two might get in the future. The US would have a few more bases, of course. It could fly planes from its Djibouti base and fly bombers from Diego Garcia and from halfway around the world using in-air refueling. Using the British base on Cyprus would be likely, and the US might even have to ask Israel to join in or give it access to its bases. That, naturally, would open a whole other can of political worms. Roughly half a dozen air bases close to Iran, just across the Gulf, and another half a dozen farther away might be plausible for the air campaign. Given the political and missile risk factor, as well as their differing sizes, those might account for anywhere from several hundred to over 500 US fighter jets, in addition to various other planes, like tankers, surveillance and other support planes. The US Navy carriers would definitely play a role there, though out of 11 carriers, two or three are usually undergoing maintenance, five or so are usually between deployments. USS Washington is forward deployed in Japan, in case China situation flares up. Such large air campaigns aren't done on short notice, so months of prep would be likely, with deployment schedules of carriers massaged so three or four can be deployed at the same time. Those would likely operate for a few months, before heavy usage would require them to sail back for maintenance. Two or so carriers might be rotated in to take their place. So the US would likely be using upward of 500 fighter jets, possibly 700, for such a large campaign. Fewer than against Iraq in 2003, but it would be rotating replacement planes into bases when needed. Most of those US planes would be F-22s and F-35s being the most capable platforms, but some Air Force F-15s would also be likely. And Super Hornets are still by far most prevalent on Navy's carriers. Given the China contingency, it's not assured the US would risk their B-2 bombers overflying Iran. The US would surely use part of its missile inventory on Iran, though considering China, it's really unlikely it would be more than a thousand or two missiles. For comparison, the short-term campaign against Iraq in 2003 saw the US use 950 cruise missiles of various types. 
Guided bombs would again be weapons of choice, of course, and ideally standoff winged bombs would often be used, like small diameter bombs or the Navy's JSAW. But again, the China factor might dissuade the US from using up most of those inventories, and to perhaps go closer in, using regular JDAMs and paveways. That being said, if the US starts losing more planes than it would be comfortable with, due to greater exposure to Iranian defenses, that too might change. The US could also use some attackers missiles to strike Iran's coastal sites from the other side of the Gulf, but again most of those would likely be saved for China. But enough about the US. What sort of defenses does Iran have? It could defend in two ways, passively relying just on interceptions and actively going after US forces, trying to lower the number of US attacks. When it comes to mostly passive defenses, the air defenses come first to mind. Trouble is, unlike with the Navy or even the Air Force, the numbers there are simply not known to the public. They can be estimated though. A decade ago, Jane's analyst Shauna Connor did a piece on Iran's defenses, locating some 24 early warning radar sites, 38 long and medium range SAM sites with a deployed unit and 31 more prepared but undeployed sites. Figures may have grown since then, but probably not several fold. Also, there is likely more SAMs than just the deployed ones, though also usually fewer of those than the number of undeployed sites. While Iran has in the past relied on old US SAMs from before the revolution, adding to them some Soviet and Chinese SAMs, they have also been working on domestic systems for a few decades now. Finally, from the 2010s onward, they started replacing most of the older SAMs with their domestic designs. There are still similarities, of course, with other SAMs out there, but capabilities-wise, there is a high likelihood that current Iranian SAMs have managed to improve on 1970s technology, even if they're not cutting-edge systems. The Rod SAM family has several sub-variants, like the Tabas and 30 Kordad. They all seem to rely on second-generation Russian book or second-generation Chinese HQ-16 SAM system design features but also incorporating Iranian experience with the US designed SM-1 missile, though some Iranian missile variants seem to be larger. The launcher vehicle uses a phased array radar and has been credited with shooting down the US Global Hawk drone in 2019, roughly 21 miles from Iranian shores, though the position of the launcher itself is not known, it was plausibly at least a few miles inland. But given the ranges of Russian and Chinese missiles, and the larger dimensions of Iranian missiles, it's plausible the entire family of missiles which the Rod Sam family uses can indeed reach between 30 and 60 miles. The 30 Kordad Sam can also use different smaller missiles, like the Day 9, for shorter range engagements. The longer range Kordad 15 Sam system uses larger Sayad 3 missiles. Sayad 2 was allegedly a reverse engineered SM 1, which Iran had before the revolution. The later variant was reworked and enlarged, so given that and decades of newer technology development, it may now plausibly reach targets at over 60 miles. Iranian Defense Minister had at one point said Sayad 3 reaches 75 miles. Kordad 15 was unveiled in 2019, so it's less likely many have been made until now. The Lash Sam system is comparable, using the same missiles, but its launcher vehicle is truck-based. Then there is the Bavar 373 long-range SAM, in service since the late 2010s. It seems to rely on Sayad 3 missile designs, but enlarged even more, moving away from standard missile family design with mid-body wings and towards more typical long-range SAM missile designs. The Sayad 4 missile that it also uses is apparently over 23 feet long and over foot and a half in diameter. Given the older technology missiles from the 1980s were primarily guidance limited in their range, today's technology should plausibly allow the Iranian system to reach over 100 miles. Various even longer range claims exist, of course, but none can be verified. But it is entirely possible that Iran remained at just 4 S-300 systems ordered from Russia because its own domestic SAMs got to the point where domestic stuff was deemed good enough. There are also short-range systems like the Mursad-16. There's the legacy system like the Yazahra, which is really a copy of Chinese HQ-7, which itself is a copy of the French Kortal. We can't list all the systems Iran is developing as there are a bunch, and it's really beyond the scope of this video. 
There's the 358 SAM, which is allegedly a loitering SAM missile designed to deal with drones, helicopters and slow cruise missiles. As it's slow itself, it's apparently designed to be fired into an area where a cruise missile or a drone will likely come. It loiters over the area until it darts towards the threat. A curious design for sure. It's likely that by now, with all these new systems in production, the old S-200 have been retired, as well as S-75, SA-6 and Rapiers. Possibly the US-designed Hawk is also gone or nearing retirement. Iran did buy some TOR systems from Russia during 2000s, and possibly some Panzers as well, though that remains unclear. The best this video can do is use usual production ramp-up figures for new systems and apply them to new Iranian SAMs in production for the last decade or so. Do take the following Iranian SAM inventory table with a grain of salt. Iran's radars to go with the new SAMs have also improved and are by now largely using phased radar arrays. One interesting radar to single out would be their Quds radar, seemingly a copy of Belarus Vostok radar. Being a VHF band radar, it could help detect stealth jets from significant distances. When it comes to active defense, it's unlikely Iran would mobilize its ground army and venture into Iraq, trying to reach US forces in Kuwait, for example, or go even farther to reach all the other US bases. Iran's navy is quite anemic, tailored to blocking the Gulf itself. The brunt of US ships would likely not even enter the Gulf, and if some would remain there, those would stick to opposing shores, helping protect the bases there. Basically, Iran's navy would not get many chances of striking US ships, subs and carriers. Carriers themselves would patrol easily 400 or more miles away from Iranian shores. The Iranian navy is simply too obsolete, with ships too small in size and too few in numbers to do much to US fleets. At best, outside the Gulf, a very lucky Iranian submarine might achieve a hit on some US picket ship. Iran's air force would be another way for Iran to defend by striking US assets, like ships, air bases and so on. But again in practice, Iran's air force is simply obsolete. It could not hope to get enough planes in the air and survive an attack attempt. At best it could try to lob some standoff missiles onto US fixed sites and bases, with questionable results. Perhaps a better use of said force would be to try and disperse them around the center and north of Iran and then use them sporadically to harass US strike aircraft groups, when deemed appropriate. The US would likely do a few very large strike packages per day, with dozens of escort fighters per package. There is literally no plane in the Iranian arsenal that's not at least 40-year-old design, and they've had little means of keeping those planes modernized. Most of their missiles are old tech, radars as well. Most planes are small and can't carry much, Going against modern stealthy jets, Iran would seldomly achieve hits in air-to-air -air combat. They don't have Maverick. Two Iranian groups of systems would do most damage to the US. Their ground-launched missile arsenal, as those would be hitting US bases including the air bases, and Iranian air defense systems. US Central Command General McKenzie said in 2022, Iran had over 3,000 ballistic missiles. Given that some of the bases with US personnel would be just a hundred miles away from Iran, pretty much all those missiles would either be fired at US forces or would be hunted down by the US from the air. The latter being less often, as history showed that actually finding and engaging missile launchers is not easy. Especially when the target is not the Houthis who have only a semblance of air defenses, but Iran. Then again, US recon capabilities, including satellites looking for missile plumes as they launch, have grown tremendously. Iran would also launch an unknown number, but plausibly a few thousand of cruise missiles, as well as thousands of various kamikaze drones, like Shahid drones made famous in the Ukraine war. By now, most of those drones and missiles have plausibly been modified to use satellite guidance, probably leading to errors in precision that are under 100 yards even if the defender uses satnav signal jamming near all locations. The US would use months of prep time to seriously bulk up its own air defenses, possibly deploying most of its THAAD anti-missile batteries and a few dozen of its Patriot SAM batteries. In addition, US ships parked near Saudi shores would help with the air defenses. 
There is no way of knowing how many Iranian missiles and drones might go through and how many of those would achieve hits. But given Iranian lack of time-critical intelligence gathering assets, most of those would be fired half-blindly. Not at specific targets like planes on an apron, but at air bases and other bases in general. Possibly hundreds of US personnel would get killed. Possibly tens of aircraft or air defense system vehicles might get destroyed on the ground. But in the greater scheme of things, it would not hurt the US military too much. While combat planes can in theory do two or even three sorties per day, such long-haul campaigns would see them doing fewer, meaning sortie figures that can be upkept. From past campaigns we know that's close to half a sortie per combat plane per day in the long run. So those let's say 600 US tactical combat planes would be doing 300 combat missions per day. Most might be fighter escorts early on in the campaign, but then those would fall to 20% of sorties when most of the Iranian Air Force would be rendered ineffective. But the number of ground strike sorties needed would be staggering. The immediate target set might be just 5,000 targets or so, if the US decides to largely leave Iranian industry, road infrastructure and Iranian ground force intact. Still, a sortie rarely equals destruction. The US would expend much more than just 5,000 bombs and missiles. Some munitions would malfunction, a sizable number would be shot down, some would miss, some would hit decoys and many targets would need multiple weapons used. Comparison with the 2003 Iraq campaign is again apt, though there three quarters of strikes were in support of ground troops. Against Iran that would not happen. But more strikes would be needed against bigger Iranian air defenses, air force, navy, much bigger missile force and overall much bigger fixed site target set, easily leading to 10 or 20,000 strikes or more. Iraqi defenses were in shambles after the 1991 war and a decade of other ops and sanctions. Plus Iraq was closer, leading to more sorties possible. Now in 2024, Iran would be a much more capable opponent than the leftovers military of Iraq 20 years earlier. It's a much bigger country, with more targets and more dispersed targets. To say that 20,000 combat sorties would be needed might not be an overstatement. At suggested 300 combat sorties per day, that might result in a 2-3 to three months long campaign. Possibly longer due to tanker planes taking up precious base real estate resulting in actually fewer than 300 combat sorties per day. Over Iran, the US forces would definitely be exposed to contested skies, mostly due to Iranian air defenses. The outcome of the air campaign, however, would not come into question. Initial US barrage of missiles and strikes on the Iranian coastal targets, Iranian barrage of missiles on US assets, then a steady and unrelenting stream of US airplanes striking deeper and deeper into Iran. The US would be using its ample recon assets to search for various targets inside Iran. The satellite fleet alone can offer hourly revisit times during daytime and clear skies. US spy planes can offer 1 meter resolution imagery from almost 200 miles away. The still classified fleet of stealthy recon drones like the so-called RQ-180 has plausibly reached a dozen airframes by now. Using those, the US might even be able to gather targeting info even when overflying certain parts of Iranian territory, despite air defenses. During the first month, most of Iranian missile stocks and air force would be either depleted or neutralized. A good part of their SAM network would be damaged. And by the time the campaign ends, most of their air force would be gone. Most of the medium and long range SAMs gone, almost all of their navy gone their missile and nuclear research facilities would be wiped out. When one counts the damage to the economy, the fossil fuel industry and the power network, Iran would overall be pushed back over a decade into the past, being forced to take time and effort to rebuild all those capabilities. Before we go, we wanted to ask you what you think of YouTube Shorts. We released another short a few days ago, so feedback would always be welcome. There's a link to a community poll about our shorts in the corner of this video. Feel free to participate. Interaction of you, our audience, is always very welcome. Everything matters to a YouTuber. Did you subscribe, did you hit the like button on the video if you liked it, did you leave a comment, and did you check out our channel's community section and help us out in that poll. Until next time, salutations.
And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.